If I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and everybody's going that way. And narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. But you know what? That's just the opposite of what Jesus himself tells us the situation is. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. And narrow is the door that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, Jesus didn't say this because this is how it has to be. People who are on the Broadway don't have to stay on the Broadway, and that's where we come in. That's where our prayer, that's where our love, that's where our intercession, that's where our witness comes in. We need to really invite people to leave the path that's leading to destruction and find the person of Jesus Christ who can lead them to true life here on this earth and eternal life. Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. It's really great to be with you again and to be with Peter Herbeck again. And Peter, you know, each year we have a, a gathering for all our supporters of Renewal Ministries. Hey, why don't you tell folks a little bit about who we are? Yeah, Renewal Ministries, you know, we're committed to the promotion of evangelization and renewal in the Catholic Church. We do that through radio, television, lots of conferences, parish missions. We work with diocesan staffs, priest retreats, things like that. And then we'll ID 916. ID 916, the young adult ministry that we're doing. I almost forgot about that. Thanks for the, reminding me. Uh, and then we're working in about, this, past, this year, we're working in about 35 different countries in, uh, on doing 41 international missions in Eastern Europe, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, working with bishops, priests, and lay people on the ground in those countries promoting the new evangelization. And that's what it's about. And we have lots of supporters, and people support us in different ways. Through prayer, we have many people who support us around the country and around the world praying for us. And it's a hugely, hugely important piece, I think, of our work. Also, people support us financially in the work that we're doing. And, and then thirdly, we have uh, brothers and sisters, lay people, religious sisters and priests and even bishops who come with us on our international mission trips. And they're part of our short-term mission teams. And so we gather many of those people each year at the gathering. It's a time of, it's like a family gathering, a communion and mission together. And we take time to seek the Lord, to pray, to fellowship. And then often just the Lord puts things on our heart like he did this year at the gathering for you and the talk you gave, I think really uh, provides vision, uh, clarity, what's the Spirit saying to us, that kind of stuff. So that, that's really what the gathering is about and that's who we are. Yeah, we have a little video here we're going to show from the gathering, but you know, folks can just go to our website, renewalministries.net and look at, see what happens on mission trips. There's fantastic photos there and there's great videos and all that stuff. All so. our TV, all our radios there on the website. Our, news, our monthly newsletter, which people love, it's all there. We've got free booklets. We've got a lot of free stuff yeah. on there. It's put there to build you up and, and to encourage you. So go to the website and just browse it, have some fun, and just take time to see what's there because it'll really, it'll really help you and strengthen you and encourage you. Great. Well, let's take a look at the video, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. I'd actually like to read a little bit more from that passage from Hebrews, starting at verse 18, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. You have not approached that which could be touched, and a blazing fire and gloomy darkness and storm, and a trumpet blast and a voice speaking words such that those who heard begged that no message be further addressed to them, for they could not bear to hear the command. Here's the command. If, if even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Talking about Mount Sinai, the appearance of God, the giving of the Ten Commandments. Indeed, so fearful was the spectacle that Moses said, I'm terrified and trembling, but not for you. No, you've approached Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and countless angels in festal gathering. I think this is a little foretaste of it. I mean, you know, we don't have our angelic bodies yet. We don't have our angelic clothes yet, but it's, it's shining through anyway. You can kind of see it in anticipation. And the firstborn, the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the just made perfect. One of the things the Holy Spirit is trying to do is to make us perfect. You know, he's got quite a job, doesn't he? <laughs> but he will do it. The Holy Spirit will make us perfect so we can stand in the presence of God. And Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood that speaks more eloquently than that of Abel. And then the passage that Peter read, see that you do not reject the one who speaks. 
For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much more in our case if we turn away from the one who warns from heaven? Now, a mentality has developed in the church that, you know, there's that awful Old Testament God, you know, who is kind of strict and whatever, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And here we have the nice new covenant and how nice Jesus is, and it's all love. But one of the things that God was trying to do to prepare for the coming of Jesus is to teach his people his holiness. That's why when people touched the ark, they died. That's why they couldn't enter without cleansing themselves. God was trying to teach his people his holiness in order to prepare them to appreciate what it was when the Holy One became flesh. When the beloved Son came in our midst, when he shed his blood for us, it's the Holy One doing this. It's the Holy One offering his life as a sacrifice for us. And that's why it says here, if the punishment was severe in the old covenant for violating the holiness of God, it'll be even more in the new covenant because the gift is so much more precious. It isn't just clouds and and noise and fire on a mountainside. But now it's the beloved. Now it's the word made flesh. Now it's the son of God. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much more in our case if we turn away from the one who warns from heaven? How does the warning from heaven come to us? It comes in our conscience. It comes in the spirit convicting us of sin. It comes from the spirit warning us. But it really very majorly comes in the word of God. Jesus warns us what will lead to destruction, what will lead to life. The warning that's coming from heaven is the revealed word of God, revealed to us by Jesus, passed on to the apostles, handed down over the centuries, found today in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. His voice shook the earth at that time, but now he has promised, I will once more shake not only earth but heaven. That phrase, once more, points to the removal of shaken created things so that what is unshaken may remain. Therefore, we who are receiving the unshakable kingdom should have gratitude with which we should offer worship pleasing to God in reverence and awe. It's truly awesome that the word became flesh. It's truly awesome that he gives his body and blood to us in the Eucharist. It's truly awesome that his Holy Spirit is dwelling in us and we're now temples of the Holy Spirit. We're members of Christ's body. It's truly awesome what he's made of us and who he is that has made that of us. For our God is a consuming fire. So even in the new covenant, We can't forget the holiness of God. There's even a greater holiness that has come into our hands. And so we need to approach God with that reverence and awe and be ever so diligent to listen to the warnings from heaven. Okay. Now, what's being shaken? Pretty much everything. The world. ISIS, Iran, the confusion amongst the governments of the world that seem confused about what to do about almost anything, the rise of aggressive Islam, and aggressive secularism. The hatred towards God is expressed not just in the killing of Christians, but the hatred of God is also expressed in our own countries in trying to silence the warning from heaven, trying to silence the word of God. So much talk about bullying, and the biggest bullies seem to be the bullying people or the anti-bullying people, which has happened in the states of Indiana and Arkansas where they tried to pass religious freedom laws, and all of a sudden the whole world jumped on them, and Microsoft and Google and all those cool places to work said, we're going to pull out of your states. You're going to lose jobs, and they caved in under economic threat. All the pizza makers and bakers and florists who don't feel they can really contribute towards same-sex weddings, it's absolutely vicious 
what, what's happened to them. One, one time on our website to see what was happening to this little pizza parlor in Indiana, and the most vile, disgusting things were being said. And, and they, were, they, were, they were wishing those people death. They were, it, was, it was just like you know, a look into hell almost. And then, of course, Ireland. I don't know if anybody quite would have dreamed that something like this could have happened even a couple of years ago. 800 years of persecution, 800 years of poverty and famine didn't dissuade them from their faith. But 30 years of prosperity and trying to catch up with the advanced nations of Europe has infiltrated a poison into their system. And it's very much like what it says in Romans chapter 1. They knew God, but they didn't thank him or worship him. And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped the creature rather than the creator. Something like that has happened. It's happening all over. People are exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And the result of that, Holy Scripture says, is that they're given over to darkness. They're given over to their own disordered desires. Their minds are darkened. And, and all kinds of confusion enters in, uh, sexual confusion, gender identity confusion. It's, it's all there in Romans chapter 1. It's just all there. Love dries up. Families break down. About a month ago, a man named Frank Bruni wrote a column for the New York Times. And in the column, he says, you know, what's really standing in the way of our agenda, he's talking about the gay agenda. Who wants to talk about this stuff? I don't want to talk about it, but they're making us talk about it. What he said is that the only thing standing in the way of the gay agenda is the Christian churches. And they're starting to crumble. And he mentioned a number of mainline churches, the Episcopal Church, the United Church of Christ, the Presbyterian Church, they've seen a way of changing their teaching, and we absolutely have to demand that the other churches do the same thing. Religion is going to be the final holdout and most stubborn refuge. Conservative Christian religion is the last bulwark against full acceptance of all that. And then he talks about all the books that are being written, reinterpreting scripture and saying, why don't they get with it? Why don't they read these books? And then one of the people that he's drawing on as a source said, church leaders must be made to take homosexuality off the sin list. Well, we didn't put it on the list, so we really can't take it off. <laughs> it's not our list. And it's just one of so many things, of dozens of ways in which we can seriously offend against the holiness of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you know, it says, don't let anybody deceive you. The immoral will not enter the kingdom of God. And it doesn't single out one sin or another. It throws them all in there. You know, fornication, adultery, homosexual behavior, robbery, you know, thieves, uh, misers, drunkards, uh, just all kinds of ways in which we can grievously offend against the Lord. And, and very similar list in Galatians chapter 5, and very similar list in Ephesians chapter 5, and very similar list in Revelation 20 to 22. This is the voice warning us from heaven, out of love. This is the voice warning us from heaven, and we better heed it. People want to silence that voice. People want us to mess with the list. People want us to allow their sin to be called virtue. I'm waiting for other, you know, people with favorite sins to say, well, if you're going to take that sin off, take my sin off too, you know? <laughs> and none of us like to be confronted by our sin, except it's God's mercy that confronts us with our sin. It's God's mercy that refuses to hide the truth because there is a structure to reality. There really is a heaven and there really is a hell, and there's a structure to reality. And the voice is warning us from heaven how to end up really, 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 really happy. And what the consequences are to reject that happiness, to reject that truth, to reject that love and that life. Pope Francis recently said something interesting. Of course, he says something interesting almost every day. <laughs> We're waiting for him to kind of somehow put it all together. But he says, I wish he's talking to Pentecostals in, in Phoenix, Arizona. 
uh, sponsored by the Catholic Diocese there and a lot of Pentecostal pastors. He's almost at his best when he talks to Pentecostal pastors. I mean, he's, he just says fabulous stuff. So he says, I wish to say something that may sound controversial or even heretical, perhaps. I don't think we've ever heard a pope say that. But there's someone who knows that, despite our differences, we are really one. It is he who is persecuting us. It is he who is persecuting Christians today. He who is anointing us with the blood of martyrdom. He knows that Christians are disciples of Christ, that they are one, that they are brothers. He doesn't care if they're evangelicals or Orthodox, Lutherans, Catholics, or Apostolic. He doesn't care. They're Christians. And that blood unites us. Today, dear brothers and sisters, we're living in a ecumenism of blood. This must encourage us to do what we're doing today, to pray, to dialogue together, to shorten the distance between us, and to strengthen our bonds of brotherhood. That's a prophetic word, isn't it? But not only is he, the enemy, the evil one, killing Christians, he's also seducing souls, big time. Seducing them from truth to lies, from holiness to unrighteousness. Sometimes it really does seem like all hell is breaking loose and it's accelerating. It's almost hard to keep up with the eruptions of satanic victories that, that, are, that are going on. And there's so much pressure these days for people to be on the right side of history. Well, the right side of history actually leads to the edge of a cliff. I want to read you something that Jesus showed St. Faustina. One day I saw two roads. One was broad, covered with sand and flowers, full of music and all sorts of pleasures. People walked along it dancing and enjoying themselves. They reached the end without realizing it, and at the end of the road, there was a horrible precipice, the abyss of hell. The souls fell blindly into it as they walked, so they fell. And their number was so great that it was impossible to count them. And I saw the other road, or rather a path, for it was narrow and strewn with thorns and rocks, and the people who walked along it had tears in their eyes, and all kinds of suffering befell them. Some fell down upon the rocks, but stood up immediately and went on. At the end of the road, there was a magnificent garden filled with all sorts of happiness, and all these souls entered there, and at the very first instant, they forgot all their sufferings. That's how it's going to be. In the twinkling of an eye, we'll forget all our sufferings because we've been faithful to Jesus. God is so merciful. His voice is, is sounding forth, trying to awaken people to her heading towards the cliff. That's also where evangelization comes in. That's also where we have a role to play. He's entrusting us to work with him in reaching out to those who are on the broad path heading off the cliff. How shocking it's going to be when those who really wanted to be with the cool people on the right side of history found out they were on the wrong side of history, opposed to Jesus Christ. One of the things the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, section 1864, there are no limits to the mercy of God, but anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting rejects the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. God is merciful, but there needs to be a response to mercy. There needs to be repentance. There needs to be faith. There needs to be saying, I need mercy. I have sins that need to be forgiven. I can't save myself. I can't live forever. I can't conquer death. But Peter, you know, even though I gave that talk, I, I really got a lot out of listening to it again, <laughs> really. I did doesn't, too. Doesn't yeah. that happen? Yeah, it went, it went so fast <clears throat> listening to it. That's a good sign because there was, there was good meat all the way through it. I think it's a, a great word for where we are at right now. You know, both the passage, but also the way you opened it up. And I think um, being able to understand clearly that, that the scripture is giving us a warning. It's telling us this way danger, this way safety, this way death, this way life. God wants us all to choose life, but we have to choose life. We can't just drift along and then we're all going to end and assume we're going to end up in the same place, you yeah. know? So I, I'm in my own conscience, you know, as I was listening to you, in my own heart, 
I was thinking about, you were, you were talking about the Romans 1 passage where we suppress the truth about God and when humanity suppresses the truth about God and God's commandments and what he wants us to do, uh, we end up following the broad way and all kinds of things happen. Disorder, you know, the, they talked about homosexuality and all the list of all these other sins. And sometimes we can get accused of saying, well, you're just picking on those people who are born that way and can't help it. And as I was listening to, I thought about my own life at one point. I mean, there was a time in my life where I was freely embracing immorality. You know, there were certain things I wanted to do and I did them and, it, and even if my conscience was trying to get me to stop, I ignored my conscience because I knew what I wanted and I'm gonna do what I wanna do until, until by God's grace and actually, you know, some of the preaching you did, this is way back in the 70s as my life was beginning to change and other people, good priests and others who were so clear, by God's grace I came to see, you know, my beha the behaviors I'm choosing or the things I think I can't live without Otherwise, I won't be happy in this life. If I keep doing this, I'm not going to enter the kingdom of God because of the lists that the, the Lord, this is the Lord's warning to me, saying, Peter, stop living that way. I want to save you. Come. You have to turn away from that because you might find it pleasurable now or you might think you need it now and you can't imagine living without it, but this is actually what's killing you. Yeah. And I want to save you. So turn away, repent, come with me because I want to bring you home to the Father. Your point, I want to make you holy and present you to the Father. So yeah. all that was stirring up during yeah. your talk here. Yeah, yeah. yeah just the, uh, the whole idea that God in his mercy is actually warning us from heaven yeah. in so many ways, you know, in, in, in what's happening in the world, the shaking that's going on in the world, but most particularly in the clarity of what he's telling us about which way leads to happiness and which way leads to hell. You know, right. it's just, it, it's, you know, you just, people think, well, this, this is old fashioned scripture, or this is oppressive, or this is, this needs to be reinterpreted. You don't want to reinterpret the clear word of God that's trying to save your life. Right, right. And I was thinking 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul tells us, you know, that that Jesus is reigning at the right hand of the Father. He says, Christ must reign. And what does Christ want from us? He wants to reign in our lives as the Lord because that's who he is. He's the Lord of all. And Paul says he's now uh, making war on the enemies of God. And he, when he comes again in glory, all the opposition to God, all the indifference toward God, all the drifting along with the culture, all, the, all of us living with our own lists, we're going to find ourselves on the wrong side of history, as you said, and the judge of the living and the dead will stand there and he will reveal to us from our own heart the words that I spoke, the things that I did that I refuse to repent of, I refuse to change, and then God's judgment's going to come on me because I refused to heed the warning. You know? yeah. So, yeah. Well, you know, Jesus warns us that it's going to look really different when he reveals what's really going on, that some that look like they're first now are actually going to be last, and some that look like they're last and have no consequence in this world are going to be the great and holy ones. You know, it's, it's going to look different. Yeah, it definitely is. And I think the, the uh, Paul's line, uh, he talks about his own turning to God and responding to the revelation that he received. And he says, now, as a, disciples, as a disciple, I live no longer for myself, but for him who for my sake died and was raised. I make it my aim now to please the Lord. That's the decision. I want to now please him and move in his direction. We're not sitting here saying we're without sin. We never, you know, but what we're saying is because of God's grace, we now want to fight against that stuff in us and yield to God's grace and say yes to him and turn away from the things that we used to do because we want to walk with him and let him accomplish in us as Lord what he wants to accomplish. Yeah, that, that's really a great way of saying it, Peter. We're going to tell people a little bit now about how they can get this booklet. It's called Forever Grateful for Mercy. It's pretty much a, a short summary of what we were talking about today in the program. We'd like to tell you how you can get it and how you can use it as an evangelistic tool. This is something you can share with people. It's another way of sharing the gospel message and trying to wake people up to hear the voice that's speaking to them from heaven. And when we come back, we got some closing remarks. Yeah. There's a lot of talk about mercy these days, but not a lot of understanding about what it actually is. And besides, there's a huge deception which presumes that God is so merciful that hardly anyone will be lost. In this booklet, I explain what scripture and the church actually teach about mercy and what kind of response is necessary for it to be effective in our lives. I also explain what Jesus told St. Faustina about divine mercy and the tragic consequences of not responding to it wholeheartedly. 
This booklet will greatly help you live with confidence in turbulent times and will help anyone you share it with to open their hearts to receive mercy while there is still time. Order your free copy today by going to RenewalMinistries.net or by calling 1-800-282-4789. Peter, you know, I, I just think that passage from Hebrews really pulls the veil back in a certain way about what's really going on. Mm -hmm. We're receiving a warning from heaven and everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And the only thing that won't be shaken is what's in Jesus. Right. And where each one of us are being called on this program today by the Word of God. Each one of us is being personally called by Jesus to come to Him. And those of you who are watching, we were just talking, we'd, we'd like to actually pray mm -hmm. right now, pray with you. And uh, this is a moment when God's Word goes forward, it's a living Word, it's alive. God is speaking to you today and making an appeal to you and to, to each one of us to come closer to Him, to say yes to Him. So let's pray. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father in heaven, we hear your word that saves us, your son, Jesus Christ. We receive the warning that you're speaking in love to us. And Lord, I pray for all those who are listening today. Brothers and sisters, you know if the Lord's touching you and prompting you. And take this moment to be able to offer to him your heart, to turn away from those sins that you're clinging to. You can do that right now. You begin to come more deeply into relationship with Jesus. And if you'd like to pray with me, Father in heaven, I thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. I hear your word and your warning. Lord, forgive me for my sins. I want to follow you. I want to enter your church or live in your church with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to please Jesus. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Come, Lord, lead me to the Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Peter. You know, there's a scripture verse that's coming to mind right now. It's, it says this. It says, if today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. When, when the light of God shines into our soul, we're, we're, we're faced with a choice. Are we going to kind of turn away from that light and, and, and cling to our darkness because we feel threatened and we don't want to change? Or are we going to recognize that that light is love coming to us? That light is healing coming to us. That light is freedom and truth and goodness coming to us. And have the courage to humble ourselves and say, I need that light. I need that healing. I need the forgiveness of my sins. I need to recognize that Jesus really is the Lord and really believe his word. So today, if you've heard his voice, harden not your hearts. <laughs> 